the pitch. Swing and a miss. That's the ball game. How about that? The Aggies scored two in the ninth, but the Volunteers, Tennessee, the climb is complete. They have reached the summit. The Volunteers are the very best in college baseball. And the championship flag has been planted on Rocky Top. For the 60th and final time this season, Tennessee says hello, win column, and hello, national championship. Everybody in Ball Nation can stand and repeat or say with me, while they are wearing black, the national champion is clad in big orange. It's Tennessee over Texas A&M. The final score. Ball six, Aggies five. The dream has come true. This is Tennessee baseball. Since 2003, this is the Sports Source. East Tennessee's number one sports talk show. Presented by Hype Wrench, and by Junk Be Gone, and by the Garza Law Firm. With your host, John Pennington. The Sports Source starts now. Good Sunday morning and welcome into the Junk Be Gone studios for the Sports Source. What do you say we talk about a national championship for Tennessee today? First national championship of any kind since 2009. First ever national championship for baseball. And we're going to talk a whole lot of baseball today, as a matter of fact. We've also got a little later in the show, we got football recruiting, because in case you haven't noticed, Tennessee has really jumped up the rankings since last Sunday when we talked about them being number 14. We'll tell you where they are a little later. We'll also talk a little bit about well, Tennessee football recruiting is rising. We'll talk about Dalton Connect falling in the NBA draft, but did he land in the right spot? But again, most of today's show about the national championship. We're going to let you enjoy that. Let's start it. First segment of our show. Well, how appropriate. It's brought to you by one of the biggest supporters of all baseball, the Garza Law Firm. Marcos and his team well, they have as many wins in the courtroom as Tony Vitello's team has on the field. When you need an attorney for any reason, reach out to the Garza Law Firm. Just a big part of the East Tennessee community, and I know they're very excited and very happy that the Vol Baseball program won the title, as you are. But in terms of winning in the courtroom, if you need somebody on your side, that's the group to go to. GarzaLaw.com to learn more. All right, let's welcome in the uh, panelists for today. We have down here Chuck Cavalleras. We have... Member of the Vol Broadcast Team, Vince Farrar, congratulations. Thank you, John. Ryan Callahan from Go Vols 24-7 right here and right there. Bob Hodge. Bob, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. All right. Uh, Vince, I'm going to start with you. Just <clears throat> let's, let's talk a little bit about the final series against a and Let's talk about what they had to accomplish. I mean, we sat here last Sunday, and it was Jimmy and uh, Will and Josh and you and me, and I think all of us – felt pretty good about them winning two straight because it you know going down 0-1 to A&M most teams you'd sit there and go oh boy that's going to be tough but when you looked at Tennessee's bats and what they'd done all year it's like eh, if anybody's going to come back from 0-1 down it's going to be them and they did but it's a heck of a ride a heck of a win your thoughts on the on the title it, it was amazing and I think the first thing I told you was I'm calm after losing that first game yeah. This team had lost back-to-back games since the Alabama series to start out SEC play. They had Drew Beam on the mound for game two, who was fantastic the game before, and he was again in that final series. And then you still have Xander Seacrest with an advantage in a game three, and he lived up to that yeah. as well. Right. They adjusted to the ballpark where they hit the ball hard, square, 
and sometimes they left the, the ballpark, and sometimes it was a double or a triple, but they still got things done uh, in clutch situations. It was fitting that it went three games, and it got a little nervy, though, at the end. <laughs> a little nervy. Because that's indicative of the season. It yeah. wasn't like 2022 where they were just rolling everybody yeah. mm-hmm. and then got into some adversity in the Super Regional. Yeah. It, it was They were knocked down sometimes, but they always had a response, and they came through in the clutch, showed different ways to win, and their best players were great. And you saw Dylan Dryling <laughs> rise up as MVP, uh, yeah. who was amazing. Seventh so, inning Dryling. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mr. June, as some people yeah. are starting to call him. <laughs> so. Well, the thing that was interesting is you're right. It did feel nervy. There were points of the season where it felt nervy. And yet, when you get through it and you look back and you say, okay, SEC champions, SEC tournament exactly. champions, uh, 60 wins, snap the number one jinx for the number one seed in the tournament. They're the first team since Wichita State decades ago mm-hmm. to win 60 and the title, I think. Was yeah. that correct? Yeah. So yeah. you're right that, boy, can they really pull it off and do it? And then you get through it after they've done it. It's like, well, of course they did it. Look how darn good they've been. <laughs> yeah, this was a, it was a good team all year. I mean, yeah. to Vince's point, I, I tried to tell people this week, the 2022 team, if you were picking one on paper, was the better team in a lot of ways because they had the, the three ridiculous starters in the rotation. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you had a lot of things this team didn't quite have, but this team still had the dominant mm-hmm. offense. They still had really good pitching. It was just a team that sort of found different ways to get it done and were more well-rounded in some ways. And they – I think the fact that Tennessee had been there before this time was a big deal. I think they had they had some guys like Blake Burke who had been there, done that. They, they were experienced. They they had Billy Amick even that, is, that was battle tested from Clemson. So you had some guys that uh, that weren't weren't shook by the by the situation when they got down nine four to Florida State. They knew how to come back from things like that, and that was a big deal for this team because they had to win a close game. Well, and, and it, I was I put too much stock in that game against Evansville, which they lost. I'm sitting there watching that Evansville beats them. And, and Tennessee did have some fielding problems this year. They had games where they got sloppy on defense. A couple of the two they lost in the College World Series. And I was, sitting there, I, I was sitting there, I was sitting there, and I was thinking they're, they're pitching, you know, from what I watched. The one they lost. Okay, their pitching just wasn't up here. You know, you didn't have the kid from Texas A&M, the yeah. starter. And so I wasn't confident that they were going to win, even though they kept doing exactly what you guys said. Okay, they lose the game, but they don't lose two in a row, that sort of thing. But I was never confident about it because that's what the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the I, I rest said, of us I, were I, overconfident. Yeah, I, I said the two they lost in the World Series. The one they lost and the one they had the miracle yeah. comeback against Florida State to win. But it was one of their two toughest games out there, the ones where they kicked the ball around, threw it into the stands. I, Chuck? I still think, you know, this team showed the heart of a champion to me so many times. Game one, Vince Was it a Tennessee. five-star heart? <laughs> five-star <laughs> heart, baby. Get that first game, you're down nine to two. In the seventh inning, and you score three runs, and Texas A&M, and I think it was a tactical error, brings in their ace closer of the year because you've scored three runs. And that came back to bite him. He pitched, what, the last three innings or so, yeah. did great. And he wasn't available as early Ex- in the Exc- And yeah. I think that was the key. And then the second game, Tennessee's the visiting team. You're down one to nothing in the seventh inning. And who earns a walk to get it going? Christian Moore. Mm-hmm. Right, and then fires up his team. He cu- curses at the Texas A&M <laughs> pitcher for not throwing him a fastball. <laughs> and then that set up the, the Dylan Drying uh, two-run homer. All three of his homers were in the seventh inning for two runs. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just – and uh, Hunter Inslee, the play he makes in the outfield, oh, the slide. Big, well, how big was the slide at the end? And one uh, credit mm-hmm. him for a great slide. At the same time, the catcher – it's like. How are you setting up there? What was that? That well, was a bizarre. I know where the throw was. Yeah, yeah right, I right, right. I know. Right, I've, right. If you've ever seen anybody like this, though, <laughs> that was a, it was a bizarre deal. Now, yeah. Inslee did a great job getting around him. Right. I mean, it was uh, like but, a matrix but, move. But you know? that was the, in hindsight, that was the play of the game. Yeah. I mean, there was your winning run. Right well, there, exactly. So. But there, there are so many little things that happened in the yeah. game, too. Mm-hmm. Blake Burke, this, was, this led to a run. Blake Burke doubled it with one out in an inning, and then he advanced a third on a on a hopper in front of him on the left side. Normally, as a, if don't you're at go. second, you don't go. Yeah. But he knew the third baseman had to go to get the ball. He wasn't available to go to third, so he took the bag. So what happens after that? You get uh, Dean Dryling, uh, Dylan Dryling, sacrifice fly to bring home a run. That's a single run. That could have been the difference also. Right. Yeah. Just fundamental stuff in addition to what everybody talks about at the home run. Well, and also, that's an adjustment to the ballpark. Right. I had somebody yeah. that we, – we, we may talk about this in the next segment, but I had somebody that – you know, got on us a couple weeks ago for saying Tennessee's played small ball all year. 
Uh, no, if you lead the nation in home, home runs, runs, that's not yeah. small ball. Uh, but that's a small ball kind of play. That's manufacturing yeah. a run right there, uh, which give them credit for. This team can beat you in a whole lot of ways. Right. right? And, and maybe, well, maybe, beat you. maybe that person was talking about they didn't do it very often, but they're usually pretty successful no, when they no, had the call. No, this person was a jerk. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, then, then uh, no credit. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that's interesting about this in hindsight, I mean, certainly you'd love to go through and just wax everybody. But once you get it under your belt, once it's done, wouldn't you rather have it with a little bit of excitement at the end? I mean, yeah. uh, we swept, won the first two games, that's it, blew them out, yeah. done. Okay, but now you got this memory. You got that call, you've got that, that last second, it's coming down, there's nerves. There's something positive about that. Once you've got it won, you're not thinking that as a fan. It's like, no. oh, God, mm. beat, the, beat them like a dog. But in hindsight, I don't know. When my teams have won titles, it's kind of fun to win that seventh game as opposed to just sweeping somebody in four, oh, in uh, hindsight. You know, then you got to consider the wild pitches there at the end fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Once it's done, yeah. it's done. So that's all you I'm know. saying, yeah. But that was the thing, and I, and I wanted to ask Vince about that. The wild pitches mm. right there at the end of the game, I think there were four. I four thought one of them might have been, could have been a pass ball. It looked like it might have right. got away from the catcher. But that surprised me because you hadn't seen that. No. That's Not, the one thing. Well, they that said the you first one seen. was the first ball that had gotten past Cal Stark, right? And then it kind of ballooned from there, I guess. But he hadn't let one well, past was, him. Yeah, he was up in that last inning. Yeah. He, and, and getting him to swing at, num- at uh, letters high uh, pitches. Yeah, that really hadn't been a, a big issue for Combs during the year. You know, maybe it was a little bit of the moment. Maybe it was just fatigue because you saw some of those bullpen guys kind of. Look like they're getting closer to the E than the F in the gas tank. <laughs> but, and it was, they were going to have to go pretty young after that if they didn't stay in. But uh, look, when, when he had the bulk and he had the Aaron Combs with a big smile on his face, <laughs> yes, that's uh, another like, classic image. That yes. to me gave me more confidence. He was like, right. whatever, yeah. I'm going to stay yeah. I mean, He thinks the runner's on first <laughs> yeah, and the like runner's that. on second. Right. He's like, yeah, I didn't they, even know he was on second base. Yeah, they're, they're, you're right. There was a face of a pitcher that, in yeah. panic. That right. you could picture. That wasn't it. No. That was a guy who was like, I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> very calm, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was good. And then right. Xander Seacrest, I'm sorry, real quick. His demeanor, I think, calmed them in the moment, too. Sometimes you don't get calls from umpires. He has he had the perfect demeanor to start that deciding game. And what's the over and under okay. on how many times his hat flies off during and when he comes out there? I got it at like mm-hmm. six and a half. All right, we got, we got tons to cover, but I want to tell you one thing. We got a special opportunity for you we're going to tell you about a little later. There was a huge buildup, like I said, of fans and players, but it started in the fall when these guys decided they were going to be good to each other. And because of their camaraderie and their chemistry, really good players became great players because they wanted to help each other out and they competed for each other. And that's how that thing went down. But you know what? When you're all in it for each other, it seems to work out. And it definitely worked out for this group right here. What you guys have done for us is what Danny said and so much more. There are a lot of little kids watching you, and we saw you stop after games where you're probably tired, you're frustrated. We saw you give signatures. We saw you talking to kids. That means so much. This is the way you are. This state is unquestionably about unity. This university is about unity. Knoxville is about unity, and the best representation I've ever seen in my life of unity is the group that's on this stage right now. And all I would ever ask is you remember it, whether you're at the football game or we're down seven nothing or softball or women's soccer, whatever it is, make the decision. You're either a ball or you're not, through thick and thin, ball or not. All right, this segment brought to you by A.G. Hines Company for more than 100 years. East Tennessee contractors, construction companies, and do-it-yourselfers have trusted and turned to A.G. Hines Company for their building materials and tools. You can do the same, and when you do, you get the right materials at the right price. Visit them this week on Hines Street, appropriately enough, downtown Knoxville, A.G. Hines Company. And you saw that video there from the University of Tennessee put that out. Uh, I've told you before, I've said it for years. I don't know if there is a a department in the an athletic department in the country that has a better uh, marketing slash video group as the University of Tennessee athletic department. They are fantastic. 
uh, and uh, knew you'd want to see that for those who didn't catch it online or something. Uh, just kudos to the team over there. They put in a lot of hard work. Nobody ever knows their names. We don't run credits on those little mm -hmm. things. And they just do great work. They have for years, and it continues on. I uh, want to do a poll question today. We're going to take baseball out of it because that's immediately where everyone would start. If I asked you which sport is going to win the next national title, well, repeat, of course. All right, so I'm taking <laughs> baseball out. We're just going to give you the other big four kind of sports. You can vote football. You can vote men's basketball, you can vote women's basketball, you can vote softball. So far, women's basketball has nary a vote from people who've gotten online early. Looks like softball is the leader. Do you think men's basketball is going to win the next one? Do you think football is going to win the next one? Take your smartphone, click that QR code right there, and it'll allow you to vote and tell us what you think. Boy, we had a ton of people last week. Pat Summit won, by the way. But uh, we had a ton of people vote last week. Do that again. I want to see if softball continues to be number one, and we'll tackle this question a little bit later. Okay, you saw the parade. Uh, I saw an estimate of 50,000. Somebody said there was an estimate of 50,000 at parade and 40,000 at uh, yes. Market Square. All right, uh, you look at all that. Bob, there's no doubt winning a national title is a huge step for the program. We've discussed this, and when you talk to the radio guys in town, I'm sure you see it at Go Vols 24-7, it's still a growing sport in terms of trying to catch as many eyeballs as you get for mm -hmm. football and men's basketball. Does this make uh, Tennessee baseball a traffic center now, or is it going to take a little bit more, more wins? It's going to take more, and, I, and I'll tell you why. If you look at what is talked about, what used to be talked about, I mean, women's basketball used to get a lot more talk than it does now. The football obviously stretches back decades, a century, whatever. Basketball been more or less good you know, anywhere from, okay, way down here, but good since Ray Mears. So you've had, you've had 60 years of basketball. I think it takes a while for it to get ingrained. That said, the difference is now social media. And social media spreads things quicker, and I think it spreads things deeper than it would have years ago. So is it there right now? I say no, but I think the climb to get there is shorter than it would have been back if this had happened before the before the internet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about this with Jimmy Holmes. I think it was off the air last week. The fact that you know, I, I said, well, Skip Bertman got there at LSU and it really turned around. He said, yeah, but it's five titles in ten years. So, and yeah. that's the Pat Summit thing was year after year after year. You're getting there year after year after year. You're now in the mix every year. Um, you've won one. Will it take more? Do you think to put baseball on a level? with football and men's basketball. Can it, can it get to that level? I, mean, I don't know that anything in the South outside the state of Kentucky could get to football, so let's take that out. Right. But can it get to where it's a revenue producer as opposed to a, a, a uh, you know, uh, in the red like most other programs? Can it get to that level? Well, the, the revenue part of it, I think that's, that's, tough. that's tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, as far as on the, the mind and the landscape and the discussion points, yeah, I think it can it can be right there on the heels of men's basketball. Mm -hmm. If the Lady Vols are to have a resurgence, I think then that's in the conversation too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's it's a sport that's conducive to conversation because there's so much strategy involved. There's so many aspects that you can discuss and break down. And then another another uh, example of it is look at the SEC schools that have really good baseball historically: Mississippi State, LSU, Arkansas, in those markets. That's right up there, yep. right on the heels of men's basketball in terms of discussion points and, right. and the fan interest. So, yeah, because this fan base is so big and passionate, during that period of time, yeah, I, I say it can. It's going, to take, it's going to take a learning curve, I mean, I think. Right. Because, yeah, right. yep. Will West, we've talked about this on radio, Will West was interviewed by somebody with, from LSU in Baton Rouge about Tony Vitello. Because down there he's the most hated coach in America because they wanted to talk to somebody in Knoxville about him. This was after LSU season was done. And that shows you their interest in college baseball. Right. If the Tennessee season had ended in the Super Regional, there wouldn't have been five. Nobody would have talked about the College World Series. Uh, at the same time, you mentioned last week that somebody, you had some people reach out and say, now what is this cycle you keep talking about <laughs> with Christian Moore? So part of it is just, right. you, you know, the first year, it's like, I'm going to get into this. Then you learn more, and you learn more. I just mm -hmm. think it takes some time. Yeah. The thing that's interesting to me, though, Ryan, if you had asked me before Tony Vitello got here, 
could baseball ever get in the conversation with these other sports? I would have said no. Yeah. No. I mean, you've had high moments with Rod Delmonico, but you're never going to get in the, in the ballpark with basketball and football. I don't think that's a laughing matter anymore. Now I think, okay, there's a trajectory to get there, and mm-hmm. you've started the path. It's a, it's, a, it's a path, but you've started it. Yeah. No, I, I think that's the big thing is it, it takes a I, – I just don't know if the cultural importance outside of, you know, Tennessee's market is going to be there to – like football and basketball are just ingrained throughout the country. It's going to be hard for baseball to catch that, but can, you can be a – an LSU type market where baseball is a big deal. And I think Tennessee's on the way to doing that. And we've already seen that, you know, you mentioned on Cavalls 24 seven, the minute the season was over, people started asking about transfer possibilities. I mean, mm-hmm. everyone's yeah. interested in this now in a, in a way outside of baseball season that we never saw before five years ago. So I think we're already seeing a little bit of that. And as that continues, if Tennessee remains a contender, I think you're going to see more and more of that where fans are, are not just interested in baseball as a, as kind of a, something to fill the gap between basketball and football. Yeah, what I've, I've said for a long time, guys, is you can dominate in the spring and summer or the early part of the summer. That's where you can make your mark. And for years, I can remember as a kid, you could just walk into a Tennessee baseball game, buy a hot dog, we'll call it even. It was like the University of Tennessee didn't even care. Well, Chuck, that there was much. a time when the New Sentinel didn't even cover the baseball team on yeah, a regular right. basis. But now they're Not putting $100 million into the stadium. Mm-hmm. So I think you're really going to – and look at football with all of the recruits, Ryan. Is, yeah. is Tony Vitella signs more players, then that gets it back out there I, too. I think what you've done is you're beyond the planting the seed part of your baseball program. Yeah. But it still has a way to go before it is ingrained in this area – that oh my gosh, it's February and they're starting to play. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think you. I think you've still got a ways to go. Yeah, yeah I mean that's and that sounds like you're knocking ba- baseball. That's no, not, it's really it's, not. No, no, no not it's, at all. it's that it's it's growing. I have people that are like, well, aren't you doing more on baseball? It's like because we'd get better ratings with football, but there's nothing going on with football. Still football. That's just the way I was talking to somebody from radio this week. It's like, yeah, it's it still has to grow more. But the fact that you're even having this conversation shows the amazing job Tony Vitello has done. Right. That you're even sitting here saying, well, maybe it's possible to be the next LSU, Arkansas, or Mississippi State. So that's, that's kudos to him and also kudos to Danny White and the athletic department for putting money back into the stadium and investing in that coach. And by the way, you heard Tony Vitello there. You've heard him all week. Uh, didn't sound like a guy who would have ever entertained Texas uh, – and discussions, him. which we said last, which we said uh, so last Sunday. All right, Ryan Tony Vitello has reached cult favorite status here in uh, Knoxville. One because he wins, and two because he's controversial outside of here. And nothing rallies fans more than some other fans saying bad things about your guy, uh, Greg McElroy, who's a pretty good SEC analyst this week, uh, came out and blasted the way that Vitello celebrated after the game, which. Very weird thing to go off on. He later came out and apologized, and so be it. That's it. You know, to me, you can have a bad day and say something stupid, and he apologized, move on. But there's still a lot of people around the country. We just talked about it. The LSU, they wanted to do a story on the most hated coach in baseball. Uh, The Tony Vitello thing, uh, I just think that endears him more to East Tennesseans. Uh, We've seen it with coaches at other places. Uh, When you've got a guy and everybody else hates your guy, you love your guy more. Yeah. Uh, and I think Vitello, if he had won in 2022 with that team, which is when he really got this reputation, threw a bat, it was at Auburn, threw a bat kind of at the other dugout, yeah. bumped an ump, other guys getting suspended, the double birds. If that team had won the national title for you, I think it would have been worse for the program and worse for him. I think it helps him that he won with this year's team, which was, in my view, a more likable team, a more traditional, classy team. So it's interesting to see how people view him. He's judged for two years ago. Yep. I think it helped him that he won with this team instead of that team. Yeah, I think you're right. I, and, and that is, for, you can tell the people who have followed college baseball for years, the ones who watched that 2022 team closely, they still have that image kind of seared in their mind. They, yeah, you they, had a lot of people pulling for Texas A&M yeah. last yeah. week. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, it's hard for some people to get past that, and so he'll, he'll – He'll carry that probably for a little while, but I think people who've followed him closely have also seen that he's 
He's had different teams. He's changed a little bit, I think, just a, just a hair. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's not the same guy. So it's, it, it, it's something that they'll, they'll be able to get past that eventually, I think, if he stays at Tennessee a long time. That, that, that won't be carried with him forever. And so I, that, to that point, I think you are right that it helps his reputation that this was the team that got over the hump. And that 2022 team is just one of several great teams it looks like they're going to have. And, Bob, some of that fieriness that, that other fans don't like is what, you, you know, your own fans love that. And the people that love that more are your own players. Yep. And that's the thing. You heard so many of his players this week talking about he'd go to war for you. So the very thing that drives people in Tuscaloosa and, and Baton Rouge crazy is exactly what makes See, his players See, I sat there and I watched Tony Vitale's post-game celebration, and I thought, it's a recruiting video. Yep. He's hugging his dad, and his dad's crying. He's jumping up in the stands with yeah. fans. Yeah. He's eating ice off the grass, which – <clears throat> Excuse me. Who of us hasn't done that recently? Yeah. <laughs> and and I saw that. And so when McElroy came out with this big slam, I thought, did we see the same thing? Because yes, yeah. the twenty two stuff bothered me. And I think too many people embraced. Ah, oh, they hate us. We hate them. Well, I almost think you kind of got what you deserved in twenty two with the actions of those players. But what I saw if that had been anybody game, else, Vol fans would have loved that team losing. Oh, yeah. 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 But what I saw after this, I thought that is a recruiting yeah. video for Tony Vitalo, his reactions, the things he said, yeah. all he did. I thought, it was, I thought his celebration was great, and I think that improves his reputation. The thing bit. is, we've seen him all year. We've seen changes. And yeah. he's still young and fiery, and I, yeah. I, think, you know, yeah. one, I think he will change and evolve as he becomes a, you know, an older guy. But the fieriness, part of it is what people love. Uh, the people who are outside the market, they don't see all that. They just see that 2022. They, they watched, they saw that. Uh, it's, it's like any coach. It's like you, you see something in a game. You're not a fan of this team, but you see this coach do something. Oh, I hate that guy. And you will say that forever. Oh, I hate him because in 2017, yep, exactly. he did X. Unfortunately, you're going to have to live down that 2022 stigma for a while. But winning – the way they won this year, yeah. I just, I, it's funny that if you'd given, obviously you'd rather win both, but if you had to pick one or the other, I think it's better for UT and for Vitello that they won. With I, this year's I thought team. the whole team post game after you won the whole thing, I thought the whole thing was pretty classy. I did yeah. too. Yeah, you know, and and I could that twenty twenty two team have won and done that been that classy. Maybe, but well, I wasn't seeing it. Well, that, yeah, that <laughs> was the funny thing. You had so many people saying, well, "That's who they are. They got to win that way." No, you don't. No, you, don't. Yeah. you just saw no. this team won. Now, it didn't hurt that the NCAA, the SEC changed the rules to where you can't do right. a lot of the stuff they were doing. Yep. You know, you wonder if they'd have kept up. But still, that had nothing to do with it any more than the color of the jersey. We may get into that later. But it's the players <laughs> making plays who it's, win the game. It's not about, we don't have our daddy hat. And, yeah, that's, and to, to some of the discussion earlier, Tony Vitello's personality makes this team more popular. That's the big reason you see 50,000 fans yes. out of the parade. Yeah. It's the Bruce Pearl they, effect. It is. It's yes. very similar. Yes. It's not the yep. same. I had somebody say they're the same. I don't think they're the same, mm-hmm. but there's some similarities there. So that's, that's a big part of it. His personality makes this team popular. He's the, he's the star of this program. It wasn't a single player on this team that was more popular than Tony Vitello. Yep. All right. UT Athletic Director Danny White said the Vol Athletic Department had to break through at some point. <laughs> and, boy, it has. <laughs> uh, Tennessee just finished number three in the Learfield Director's Cup. That's their highest finish ever. That's, the, that's where you place for the entire uh, athletic year, where the athletic departments rank, and they finish number three nationally. Best finish ever. Uh, every single Tennessee program reached the NCAA postseason. Right. That's more amazing than the number. And I know <laughs> it takes that to get the number three finish. That's stunning. Right. Every program reached the NCAA postseason. 11 teams finished their sport in the top 10. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, here's my question. And they're making money among the top five schools. As of right. last year, they climbed into the top five in terms of revenue. That was not the case when Danny White arrived. So all kinds of praise and credit to Danny White, but also to the other part of the leadership over there at UT. Everything's kind of going in the right direction. My question is, and don't give me the sport. We'll discuss that in a minute. We've got the poll question for people out there. Uh, is this a sign of things to come? Do you think Peyton Manning after the game said, we right. have more teams on the come here in, in, in Knoxville. Do you think more national championships are on the way? 
Those are tough to win. Hadn't won one since 2009. Are more going to come under Danny White? Yes, I think so. Uh, and, and I think it starts with the leadership at the very top of the administration. That there, there's, there is a huge love and concern and appreciation for the athletic department. And then you've got the right guy in, in charge at the top. You've been able to keep your coaching staff and your coaches together. You've got the consistency there. So while it is difficult, yes, but you've had teams ranked number one in the country in various sports. Can you, can, you, can you take, like, another step at tournament time? I mean, I wouldn't bet against Tennessee winning another championship. So I'll say, yeah, they'll pick off at least one somewhere along the line. That's true in the last, what, two seasons. You go back to two seasons ago in football. You've had your football, men's basketball, and yeah. baseball program all ranked. Oh, right up there, one, yeah. Which uh, that's got to be a first in a two-year period in school history. Three. Another reason is coaching um, and coaching hires by Danny yeah. White. Uh, the bar was already high as it is, as it was, but now everybody's winning and uh, everybody keeps uh, elevating, you know, that, that whole boats, you know, in, yeah, in the, the water, water level. Yeah, yeah. The rising tide Ra raises, rises all boats. Absolutely. All boat. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, and so the three national coaches of the year, Antonio Vitello, Alison Ojeda, women's tennis, Kim Capini, and Rowan. By the way, that was her first year as a rowing coach, a, a, a great hire for, for Danny White. How so, long before rowing? Becomes a net, and no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so yeah, I do think because you have so many in contention from a number yeah. standpoint, and, and that new standard, I, I do think someone's going to break through. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in my lifetime, I don't know that the University of Tennessee athletic department's ever been in as good a shape as it is right now, and because of the previous 20 years, I'm still worried that just saying that somehow jinxes it and turns <laughs> right. it. It's, it's like right. you're still waiting. For something bad to happen. Uh, hopefully those days are gone. Uh, I did want to throw, you know, we're giving credit to Danny White here. We've given a lot of credit to Tony Vitello, obviously deserving. Two other people who I think their names need to be said this week. One, the guy who hired Tony Vitello was John Curry. Exactly. Uh, kudos to him. UT throws checks left and right. Maybe you should cut a little, hey, thanks. <laughs> Send it over to Wake Forest. That was a really good hire uh, on John Curry's part because nobody knew much about Tony Vitello when he brought him in here. I don't remember much fanfare uh, with him. He was just an Tony assistant Vitello. coach known for mainly for his recruiting. One. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean I'd never actually heard him. So, anyway, uh, the other person who deserves credit, Rod Delmonico. Uh, granted, the program had fallen off and Tony Vitello has built it up. But he did have some College World Series logos out on the outfield to point to and recruit with mm -hmm. because Rod Delmonico got them to three uh, different World Series. Uh, he was not the cheerleader rah-rah guy that, uh, that Tony Vitello is. Uh, at the same time, um, he left something that could be built upon. So I just wanted to throw a little credit to John Curry and Rod Delmonico this week and get their names out there. Good deal. <laughs> Let's take a look here at the poll and see where this goes because this is the question I'm going to ask these guys. Football, 17%. Men's basketball, up to 42%. Women's basketball, does that say 6%? And softball, 30 Wow, men's basketball has raced past softball. Okay, gentlemen. Next sport, if, if baseball's taken off the list and if we throw out the sports that, you know, rowing and stuff that we're never going to talk about in this show, you look at these four, who is the next champion? Which sport wins it? Let's go ahead and put the poll back up there. I'm so, oh, I see. I got a full screen. I forgot to show this graphic. There you go. Ah. Football, men's basketball, women's basketball, softball. I'll tell you what, I'll go in a direction that a lot of people wouldn't think. I'm going to go women's basketball. And here's the reason. You've got a new coach, going to bring in a new type of program. You still got Tennessee is a is a is a women's basketball school, and I think the competition at the top is less in women's basketball. You got four or five teams. You get by them, you can win a national championship. Whereas football, I think you got a pretty steep hill to climb with the Georgias and Ohio States yeah. out there. Men's basketball. Eh, you know, you've never been beyond the Elite Eight, so I'm going to go women's basketball. I am shocked, flabbergasted. <laughs> Stunned. Stunned. Your flabber is gassed. My, yes, you've gassed my flabber. Well, uh, that makes shocked. it easier for me to give the right answer, I think, <laughs> at least in my mind. I'm, I'm saying men's basketball, and I'll tell you why. I think you were one win away from getting to the Final Four, 
and uh, that was like the Purdue and the, all of the three seconds in the lane and all of Which that. Which means you won three games and you still need three more to win the title. Well, but, I mean, and, you, and Bob's right. Football, that's going to be tough with all everything out there. Yeah. Softball, that window to me is closed, especially with Oklahoma and Texas coming in, the two top programs. And, you know, maybe both basketball programs, I think, would deserve some consideration. But I think it would be men's basketball before any of the others. Well, Caldwell is taking – Kim Caldwell is taking over a program that did make – it's not like the tournament – it's not like the, the Tennessee team didn't make the tournament last year. Right. So, it is a tournament team. Uh, can her new system have that kind of an impact that quickly? Interesting. I don't know that she's on par with the South Carolinas and LSUs News, of the world. And, yeah. but, uh, you could also look at it as – that's one in 68, whereas football is one in 12. So you got a little bit, if you're just looking at pure numbers, I agree with you that Georgia and Alabama and the Ohio State's the world make it a little tougher. But it's only one in 12. Now if you get in there, it's not like you're going through a 64 team yeah. tournament if you make the thing. Um, I'm going to go softball, even with Oklahoma and Texas, simply because you've been at that level yeah, for a while. consistently for a while. If you're, if you're talking about breakthrough, as Danny White mentioned, you're simply waiting for a breakthrough with softball. I, just I agree felt, that Oklahoma right. is just – they're a dominant right. monster And right I just now. felt like softball's best chance by far was this past season, and that kind of fell apart. And it's going to be hard to build that back up again. Well, the interesting thing is, though, you can make a case for these teams. Yes. I, I mean, point. you're sitting there, yeah. and I think there was a time when you asked this question, and you go <laughs> – a yeah. What? Yeah. None. That's you know, a great point. All you know, four kind of and, in the mix. And so the fact that you can make a case, yeah, yeah that, that means you're in a good place. Yeah, that is. That's a that's a good call. Uh, I will say this. I, we were talking in between break. All of the people who sent uh, Danny White ugly emails and the Sentinel did a Freedom of Information Act and, and printed them, all those people who said, I'll never support you, blah, 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 I wonder how they're feeling now. Are they still mad over the Kim Caldwell, over the, yeah. the, the Kelly Harper no. firing? I wonder if that changed with this national championship. I'm guessing I'm some of them chilled yeah, out. Yeah, somewhat, somewhat. All right. The majority of you say men's basketball will be the next sport to break through with a national title here at Tennessee, followed by softball, followed by football, followed by women's basketball. Bam. All right. <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, three true or false questions for you guys. Let's smoke right through these. Uh, who am I giving what to who? Uh, I don't know if I decided who's getting what, so we'll just start over here. For those people already thinking repeat, Vince, true or false, the second national title in a back-to-back -back is harder than the first. The following year it is, but overall I, I would well, We're say talking back-to-back, -back, so. Right, right. So yeah. I, I would say it is it is more difficult to to do it to repeat versus the first time if you're talking back to back. Long term, I yeah. do think once you break through in the future, it can help your program having yeah. been there. But the following year, the the, the follow up is more difficult. Yeah, and I just think you look at the numbers. It's like you've had what six of the last seven national champions have been in the SEC, right? Which means the previous five of those SEC teams all won the title and thought. This is the start of a huge long run. We're going to win, and it didn't happen. <laughs> and they had, to, they had to watch somebody else in their conference win it. Yeah, it's bad. tough to win back to back, especially in this league. Some of those didn't even make the NCAA tournament the next year. Yeah. That's how difficult the gauntlet is. And it's only getting better because Texas and Oklahoma, probably top half of the league going in in terms of baseball. All right, very good. Uh, Bob, John Wilkerson said the national champions are clad in big orange. This is a salute to John Ward's great call in yeah. 1998. Mm -hmm when UT actually wore orange and white back in the day. True or false, the Vols should have won orange in the national title game. True, a thousand times true. Your colors aren't black, it includes nothing black. Why are you wearing it? True, they should have worn orange, or they could have worn white. With orange. I, I yeah. mean, no, black, lose it, sorry, horrible. Uh, and Rick Barnes, came, Rick Barnes came out this week and said, we're adding basketball uniforms yeah. that look just like the baseball. None of that, no striping. I mean, we want more black. According, according to this, you're wearing a UT uh, yeah, exactly. sports coat right now. It's amazing. Look, and I've heard, well, it was superstition since they won the other game. Right. I've heard, well, the players love black. Well, that's why I like schools like Alabama or Texas or USC where they don't give the kids a choice. Right, yeah. and that, that's the whole These thing. are our school colors. And I think, Tony, I think Tony V questioned it with a heat index of 109. 
It's Hard bizarre. Wear black. To me, it's just a question of as somebody's done marketing. It's, That's you you have a unique, you have a distinct color that Pink no one else wears. Yeah. You don't see McDonald's when you drive by a McDonald's. That that logo, it's the golden arches. It's not a cursive M this time. Yeah. It's not a purple M the next time. <laughs> you don't change it. And they were the home team, so they could have could have run what the, they wanted. if they could have worn the orange uniform, which to me is a recruiting tool, but. That's good. If you want to look like Oklahoma State, look like Oklahoma State. All right, next one. Or I told you, we'd, told you we'd make you mad. Uh, <laughs> or Lenore City High School. Yeah. All right, uh, Chuck, true yes. or false? The so-called Manning curse is officially dead, and fans need to stop talking about it. Well, I sure hope so. No, that's not, no not hope so. True or false? It's dead or not? Then I'm going to say true, and I'm going to say that he has shown up a lot of times, and it's just like it's gone sideways. But this time, when, you, when you're when you there and you win a national championship and you're there with all the other big-time coaches in the program and you celebrate and on the field after the game, let it go. Yes, it's dead. He was he was there when you beat Alabama a couple years ago. Right. He should have killed it then. It's been right. dead. Yes. Right. But people brought it up when right. they saw him I out know. there this week. Well, what it does is it tells you how much he shows up at things. And so yeah. when it goes bad, ah, oh, Manning cursed. Right. And I'd be sitting back. Is there another athlete that is as tied to his university as Peyton Manning? So that's what I've got. He's a major donor and your most recognizable asset. Don't yeah. tick him off. No. Uh, there are people that go on Twitter, please don't come back, and that kind of nonsense. It's just people wanting the reaction, the likes, and all that shit. All that stuff. That's all that Twitter is. crap, social media junk. Yeah, um, It's pretty silly because here's the thing. How many other people in that stadium? When they lose a game. Yeah. Okay, none of you get to go back either. It's, it's your curse. Barnes is undefeated, though, when he's there to Tennessee baseball. And there's a reason we talk recruiting with Ryan. He's that good. Ryan, of course, covers recruiting with GoVols247.com. Uh, Very busy month for Tennessee. Last week, we put up the graphic that showed Tennessee 14th on 24-7's rankings, and we said, is that good enough for June? We said, well, it's got to start growing here in the next few weeks. Let's see at the end of July where it is. Let's take a look where it went to in just one week. As Chuck would say, bam, it went from 14 to 10th. Tennessee now 10th overall, climbing up the list. Ryan, how'd they make such a big jump in one week? Yeah, and they were up to number nine at one point. A lot of fluctuation, obviously, this time of year. But big, big week, three commitments started on Monday with four-star offensive lineman Douglas Utu of Las Vegas, uh, one that not a lot of people had projected to Tennessee for a long time. I think Tennessee was kind of lying in the weeds in that one for a while because he didn't talk a whole lot. Nobody really knew what he was thinking. So Tennessee gets the last official visit. He announces the decision a day after that. Uh, top 100 player in the 24-7 sports composite, projected at guard. Been a long time since Tennessee landed a guard that highly ranked. So potentially a really big addition, especially with a five-star tackle and David Sanders still out there for Tennessee on the offensive line. Let me ask you this. For each of these guys you're going to mention, this mm -hmm. guy in the next two, tell me also how solid you feel about that person's decision. Yeah, I, I think I think most of these, I, it would be a surprise if they if they end up Flip. elsewhere. Is that okay. a lot of these kids? They're making decisions in the summer and they're viewing it as their recruitment's over. They're getting it out of the way before their senior season. They don't they won't take many visits uh, if at all during the well, season. That's a change in the last it's, few years it's a, it, when it was just kind yeah. of a commitment means nothing. And that's why yeah. they've been discussing yeah. a, su a possible summer signing period. Looks like that's not going to happen right now. Yeah. But um, that's this is kind of it for a lot of guys. Very very little drama usually. Um, after that Tuesday, Trey Poteet, cornerback from Wisconsin. Uh, he's a guy that's lived all over because he's the son of a former NFL player, Hank Poteet, cornerback that played for the Patriots and the Steelers and a few other teams. Uh, he's now the cornerback's coach at Iowa State, and he chose not to go play for his dad and is headed to Tennessee anyway. Um, so that interesting yeah. kind of dynamic in his recruitment. You wondered if they were sort of the, the, a dark horse contender more so than the favorite because it's, is he going to go play for his dad? He chose Tennessee over Wisconsin in the end and kind of eliminated this spring the, the possibility of going to play for his dad. But I think sneaky good pick up there, third cornerback in the class for mm -hmm. Tennessee. So got him on Tuesday. And then on Friday, you know, just as big as the YouTube commitment, I think, uh, four-star defensive lineman Marion Dye out of Indiana. Um, this is a guy up near South Bend. He's in Elkhart, Indiana, not a part of the state Tennessee recruits a whole lot. Yeah. Not a state Tennessee recruits a whole lot, but certainly not a part uh, of the state where they can usually go in and beat out Big Ten teams. They beat out Ohio State and Purdue for, for, for Marion Dye, and a big-time defensive lineman. I think he's really good. Uh, some people still sleeping on him a little bit, I think. He's a little raw, but, man, 6'5", uh, a little over 6'5", I think, 270 pounds and can run. And, and yeah. hard to find big guys like that that can move long arms, I think, like 34 and a half inch arms. I mean, he's got a really impressive build, a lot of upside. So these are three huge pickups for Tennessee. Now, dead period is underway. It runs through, what, July 24th or so? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're not going to have 
some other names pop up here. Yeah. We know a couple other announcements are scheduled for this coming weekend. I don't know that right now either of those is going to go Tennessee's way. Um, defensive lineman Bryce Jenkins and then offensive lineman Jacoby Ward. Um, I think there's some other guys working toward decisions where we don't know decision dates just yet. Uh, Christian Gass, a linebacker, edge rusher hybrid that Tennessee's recruiting out of the Atlanta area. That looks like a Tennessee-Georgia battle. And then some other decision dates that are kind of uh, more planned right now. Uh, Travis Smith, four-star wide receiver from Atlanta. That's looked like a Tennessee-Georgia battle. Yeah. Maybe Alabama also in there. I think Tennessee probably the, the favorite to land him. That's on July 13. He'll be announcing. So some of those guys still coming up soon. And then others that we're still waiting to find out that might be later in July and, and potentially even into August. So still a lot more to watch this summer. Uh, one of the services came out with their blue chip ratio this week. And for those that don't know, uh, all of the previous national champions going back X amount of years, for the most part, they have had uh, more fours and fives on their roster, at least 50% mm -hmm. fours and fives on the roster, uh, as opposed to the threes and below. Uh, Tennessee didn't make the cut this year. Is it a surprise to you that three and a half years in, Josh Eiple doesn't have Tennessee above that cut at this point? Because it sounds like you're going to be above the cut next year. If, the, if this class finishes the way they've got it going now, mm -hmm. you would think that you would be in the blue chip ratio next year. Is it a surprise to you that they aren't there yet or no? Uh, a, a little bit surprising only because you have the transfer portal to supplement that. You know, I, I, I guess they go back and count those guys' high I school so. ratings. Yeah. So, so some of those guys you would think would be four stars coming out of high school. Lance Hurd was a five star that you just got this, uh, this offseason. So, yeah, you would think with that to supplement what they've done in high school recruiting that that might put Tennessee in that mix. But, yeah, a little bit surprising, but also shows you that there's, there's more than one way to do it. And, and, the, and Tennessee's sort of hanging its hat on quarterbacks to, to get there yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But they've obviously got a roster that's got them on the fringe of the, the playoff discussion already. Very good. Pre-draft mock drafts had Dalton Connect projected inside the top ten. There were a lot that had him five, six there. Seemed he was, cl he was climbing. But one thing I always forget, and you get it every year in the, in the NBA draft, the pre-draft talk is all this. And then the draft comes, and you realize, oh, yeah, that was all lies. It was all <laughs> lies. Yep. The Zach Eady won't even be drafted in the first round. Then he climbed in the lottery. It's like, oh, that's going to be a waste. He gets drafted in the top ten, and people are like, well, he's probably going to be rookie of the year with 20 points a game. <laughs> Wait a second. What are, you, what are you talking about? And the whole Dalton Connect thing, rising, rising, rising. He doesn't get picked, and everybody's like, well, yeah, he's old. Sure. Mm -hmm. We knew that. None of us said that. And I have to, I'm going to have to remember this next year. There is no more live field lead up to a draft than with the NBA. Thoughts on Dalton Connect falling all the way to 17. He lost a lot of money, and it had to absolutely suck to be sitting there in that room while that happened. At the same time, lands with the L.A. Lakers. In terms of franchises, I, we'll talk about how good their team is, but in terms of franchises, not a bad landing spot. Uh, obviously, you'd rather have the money and go high, but did where he fell to – Ease the pain a little bit, gentlemen. I think so. Uh, yeah, ease the pain is a good way to put it because it doesn't it doesn't offset losing ten million dollars. Yeah. And it's and in some ways you can Not say much would. Yeah. yeah, I mean you can say that. I mean obviously playing with LeBron, if he's out there a lot, if he's a starter or something like that, he's yeah. going to get a lot of open looks because of the attention LeBron draws on on defense. So that that helps him. Um, also, you could look at look at it the other way. If he'd gone to a bad team like Charlotte. He could be a volume shooter on a team like that in the right situation. So it could have been it could have been good for him other ways too. But having this on a on a solid team that might be more likely to be in the playoff mix, it's all about getting to that second contract in the NBA. If you if you're a role player and can hang around for a while, you're making you know twenty million dollars a year a lot of times. So he'll make up that money if he make, takes advantage of this opportunity. So it's it's not a bad spot to fall for and sure. Vince, I think he's got a chance to be a volume shooter even with the Lakers yeah. because. Your new head coach, J.J. Redick, was a three-point gunner. That was what he played. Mm -hmm. And he's also already been talking about the fact that math works. He's looked at what the Celtics did this year, and it sounds like that's what the Lakers, that's like he, what he wants to do with the Lakers. Uh, whether LeBron allows that or not, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, it might be a place where Dolphin Connect gets an early opportunity to put up a lot of shots. Absolutely. When Rob Palenka, your GM, says that your head coach was already drawing up plays, for connects just after dra uh, drafting him, yeah. that's a good sign he's going to play play a lot, and they're going to trust in him. And, and there was comparisons to him. Rick Barnes said it, and Connect did as well. 
that Rick Barnes would show him J.J. Reddick tape, and they'd go over J.J. Reddick tape, and then Barnes has a relationship with Reddick because he'd go out to Texas and, and watch him practice. So there's there's a lot of huge positives. Anthony Davis is going to free up stuff for him as well. Oh, by the way. When he's on the floor. Well, that's true. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, they were one of the worst perimeter shooting teams mm, in yeah. the league last year. And Palenka also pointed out we don't have a weapon on our roster like him. Uh, I know there's Austin Reeves comparison because he's also white yeah. and can shoot, but it's different. He's a guy that can drive, can do a lot of things. So I think it's a really good spot, and Ryan's right. He will make up that money down the road because he's in the right situation. He's not buried on a team winning 12 games or something. I also want to mention that Josiah Jordan-James signed with the Pacers. I'm guessing that's Summer League. I, I just saw the headline. Yeah. I didn't mm -hmm. dig into it. So he signed with the Pacers Summer League, which – I'm a little surprised by that, to be honest with you. But let's oh, go ahead, Vince. He worked out with them. With, with them, yeah. I'm still surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, that said, talk about this from a Tennessee standpoint. It's disappointing. I mean, Rick Barnes would have loved to have had a top ten pick here. I just it helps. He's recruiting just fine. It's not like there's an issue there. But you know, any 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 new feather you could put in the cap, you put it in the cap. And having a guy go that highly. I would think would have been one more chip to recruit with, and instead he goes 17, which is a disappointment. Uh, yes, but I would say it's uh, this is the ultimate. Like the end game is is what's going to matter more. He's going to be able to recruit more if he's Steph Curry. That's a way bigger deal yeah. than having a top five pick. So well, he's Alvin, still recruiting with yeah. Kevin Durant, and he got to part and part connect. Yeah. yeah, Tennessee was able to recruit off Alvin Kamara's success in the NFL. He was a third round pick, I think. So you can, Good point. If, if he ends up succeeding in the NBA, it'll be fine. But yeah, he, he could have used the top ten pick for sure. It never hurts. But yeah, it's a, if he's a star in the NBA, it'll all work out. Plus, the inner lining on his jacket is going to more than yeah. pay off in recruiting. Right. For them, even Barnes is like. Man, you need to show off the whole thing. Yeah, the, the it's jersey like, on the back. Oh, I'm sure and everything. Inside. I'm sure Barnes would have liked him just flip that thing inside out. It was all <laughs> orange on the, it was straight black, straight black on the outside, and then the orange lining on the inside. Welcome back to the Sports Sources segment, brought to you by Express Frame. And when it comes to having your sports memorabilia framed, your treasures protected behind museum quality glass, I always turn to Express Frame. And look at this keepsake from Omaha. Look at the eyeballs on our, our two Cheshire Cat guys. Uh, Kilroy was here. But you've got the new panoramic shot from the final out. And I get, Chris, if you can zoom in just a tad so people can now see the uh, – the, uh, and it's okay to zoom in on it. There we go. The team is charging onto the field there. Uh, but you can get this. You can decide on the type of glass you want. You can choose the type of frame. You can mat it if you like. All of that at Express Frame, and if you go in there and say Sports Source, you get 20% off on the whole deal. 20% off uh, if you take it to Express Frame. You can pick this up, this tremendous panoramic shot to uh, remember the national championship in baseball forever. I love the Tennessee Power T national champions <laughs> yeah. on the video board. In the right video board, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like an extra deal, right? Yeah. The dead center. All right, let me go ahead and grab this from you guys. All right. Very good. Thank you. And this is what we got coming up. I said it's a big week for the SEC. Take a look at that. Tomorrow, the SEC officially expands to 16 teams. That looks like something, you know, if I were a kid, I would have that as wallpaper or pajamas <laughs> or whatever. That looks really good. Uh, but it's the new SEC 16 teams. Next Sunday on our show, we're going to do a deep dive into the expanded SEC rivalries, rivalries that matter. Tennessee just played in a conference game for the world, for the national championship. Did anyone here think of Texas A&M as a rival? I do not. No, no, no. I do no. not. They've been in the league for 12 years, and no. yet it still did not feel like a rivalry. Nope, All agreed. Right. But that is next Sunday. Right now, however, I do want to give out one last bit of congratulations to the guy who's been calling Tennessee baseball games for 30 years now. Uh, this was him making that final call the other night. Uh, John Wilkerson, man, he loves Tennessee baseball like no one else. Uh, and for him to call that last out after so many ups and downs over the decades, uh, I, I know there were plenty of us in the media who were as happy for him as we were for the team. Uh, when it comes to Knoxville media, he is the best of us. So congratulations to John Wilkerson and decades of loyal Vol coverage coming to fruition in Omaha the other night. All right, we got about three or four minutes here, which means 
we got time to kill. And I, and I, want, I, wanted, to let, I wanted to leave it to kill. Anything we didn't talk about with this national championship. Any, we can go anywhere. We can talk, you can go anywhere you want in terms of this title, who deserves credit, who will be remembered, what's next, et cetera. I'll, I'll jump in first. I mean, props as well for, for me to John because I've seen him put his every single ounce of being into his <laughs> so many calls, and I've been in the booth with him and so happy for him. And Jeff Wood is, as well, the uh, equipment manager, strength uh, conditioning. I mean, he's done so many things there. Jeff Wood has been amazing as their uh, um, as their, their top medical guy. Uh, and this team is constructed with a lot of high school players. Out of everyone on the roster, 27 high school signed players, seven JUCOs, six transfers. So this wasn't a transfer portal national championship. There were some key players in it, but not all of them. That's good for the base and the foundation mm -hmm. moving forward. The portal will be big for them because they're going to lose six of their eight position players outside of the mound, and they'll have some mound losses also. But this is now a terrific destination place in college baseball. So I do think that they're going to be – the names will be different, but I still think they'll be very good next year. I feel completely comfortable thinking that this team's going to be like this for a decade. That's a dangerous thing to think. Yeah. yeah. But you look at it – so often we look at teams in football or basketball yeah. and we go, okay, they're here to stay after every Super yep. Bowl. Oh, Every yeah. Super Bowl, this team's going to win well, five more. Their dynasty. Year. And it yeah. rarely happens. But what I've seen over the last four years with Tony Vitello, the way they just re – this wasn't supposed to be the year they won a title. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was kind of a rebuilding year. I, I just feel confident. And maybe I'm wrong. I'm the jinx. But I feel confident this team's going to continue to be right at this level. Maybe not national champion, but in right. that mix – Year in and year the, out. The transfer portal makes it possible. I mean, it's, yeah. it's way easier to patch things up and stay up there. But to Vince's point, they're, they're recruiting well out of high school. They're picking and choosing in the transfer portal. They're in a great place. So, uh, yeah, they can keep it up there. And let's not forget, this is like the fifth team that they had. That team with Garrett Crochet in 2020 probably could have made a run itself, yeah. too. So this is – they've yeah. already had it going five straight years. And they're – I think I, – you're right. I think they're going to have a decade run pretty much. And can Jeff I think head your trainer. Question? I'm sorry. I, I think I said something. He was head trainer. He's awesome. All right. Take your question in a little Let tiny different direction. Everybody worried about Tony Vitello leaving. Oh, my gosh, Texas may be coming after him. <laughs> oh, Texas. You know what? Does anybody worry about Danny White leaving? Because that may be the guy that, that you really need to sit there. I don't know what, how much AD's making everything. But you're, he makes a but lot. You're, He's got you're, a nice big bone. You're in, one such, point you're in a, such a place that maybe that's the guy that you need to make sure nobody's coming around the back door yeah. and knocking yeah. and saying, hey, you know. At, at the same time, you know, how many schools could he leave to? Now that he's got it where it right. is, yeah. I mean, how many better places can he go? Get on that championship gravy train, baby. Uh, uh, the Real quick, John, I thought it was a real telling comment Drew Bean made on stage about he was at an age where he didn't even really remember the 1998 National mm -hmm. Championship in football. Yep. And there's a whole generation out there that just yep. hear about that mm -hmm. and don't really know what it was like when it happened. And now you've seen one on television. All right. yeah. Vince, congratulations Thank again, you, man. Appreciate congratulations. It. Thanks to all these guys for being here. Uh, congratulations to the Vols. Congratulations to Vol fans everywhere who enjoyed that. Get to Express Frame. Tell them Sports Source. Pick you up one of those keepsakes. Have a good 4th of July. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. <laughs>